What's up guys, Oscar Gomez here from Master Automotive Training, smartautotraining.com. So I'm coming to you guys today here, we're going to do an AC A8 test review. Uh, this is a re-recording of an original one that I did with my class about two to three weeks ago. Unfortunately, we had some really bad audio issues, um, and I'm hoping that this time around we don't have these issues, and we're going to share this information. Sadly, I can't uh, use the audio from when I was with my students where they were interacting and all that fun stuff. Um, so it's just going to be a, a complete overview. Uh, my students who took my ASC A8 class uh, or my engine performance class are all required to take the ASC exam. If they pass it, then I pay for it. So this is what I go over with them. Um, not only have my students actually passed this test, but I've had a lot of people on YouTube who are commenting saying, hey man, this, this video helped me pass. So Hopefully with what I'm going to share with you guys, you guys are able to take your ASC and pass it. And like I tell all my students, it doesn't end with that. Make sure you guys keep taking more. Stay up to par on your education and your training. And I guarantee you guys, your ROI, your return on your investment is going to be through the roof. So let's automotive industry, one technician at a time. By you guys watching this video, we're going to be fixing it by one or bettering it by one because you decided to make yourself better and you're watching this content. We really appreciate that. I would also like to ask you guys, if you guys haven't done so already, go ahead and hit that like and subscribe button. This way you guys make sure that you guys are, are uh, that YouTube lets you know anytime we drop a new video. Also make sure you guys get notifications so you get a ding whenever we go live or we get a video. This way you guys can stay up to par. Not only are we here to train um, the new technicians, we're also here to train some of our veterans. Um, I'm also a veteran. I'm an, uh, old, an old geezer, like some of my students call me. Um, but if it's not for us, who's going to be teaching the new wave? So if you guys are 20 years in, 10 years in, 2 years in, make sure you guys are staying up to par with your education so you guys can keep helping better the industry by helping everybody else around you. So let's go ahead and get started, guys. All right, so the AAC test is made up of five different sections. Section one is general diagnosis. That's 24% of the test. Ignition system diagnosis, that's 16% of the test. Air, fuel, and exhaust repair, that's 18% of the test. Emission system diag and repair, that's 16%. And computerized engine controls, that's 26% of the actual test. These are sections that all technicians need to be actually really well-rounded in. And because our duty as a technician isn't to slap on new ball joints, brake pads, and rotors, our situation is, hey, I got this car with no check engine light, consumers complaining about a rough idle or a hesitation or sluggish uh, takeoff from a stoplight, here's the key, figure it out. And what most technicians end up doing is we pull, they pull out the parts cannon. They just start shooting parts at the car, and that's not diagnostics. That's not, that's horrible, to be honest. Um... Paul Danner, Scanner Danner, um, uh, calls them parts changers. Don't be a parts changer. And in reality, that's why we have such a bad rap as an automotive industry because of those guys that don't take it serious and don't take it to the next level where they actually want to learn how to properly diagnose. And what's most people excuse? I don't have time or I don't get paid well enough. Well, that's kind of a personal problem. Like I tell people, toolboxes have wheels for a reason. If you're being underpaid, undercut, and you're cutting corners because your boss is making you to, what you do is you wheel that toolbox out, and I guarantee you you're going to find a shop who will value you and who will pay you what you are worth. So the excuse of, oh, this and that, that's because you choose to do that. Okay, It's all about choices, right? So you made that choice. All right. So in general diagnosing, one of the things that we always want to take advantage of is the customer. And I don't mean financially. I mean, they're there. They're the one, they're the person who drives the car. They're the ones who knows the car better than you. The only time you get to see it is every oil change. And then whenever something breaks down. So how are you an expert on that particular car? So one of the things about general diag is you guys always want to make sure you ask the owner or the driver of the car. If the sister, brother, mom drops off the car, that's not any help to you because they don't know what the problem is. How are you going to duplicate the issue? And then what most shops do is they say, hey, well, uh, it might be this, throw part at it. And then when the customer comes back upset, 
Then they start saying, oh, the customer doesn't know. Trust me, the customer knows that car way better than you do. The only thing is they don't know how to fix it. So you need to ask your customer what is happening, how is it happening, when is it happening, what happened before it started to happen. This way you can get an idea of how you're going to diagnose the car. Number two is you need to know the system. What happens is most guys just jump right into it and expect to figure out what's wrong with the car. But the problem is, is they don't understand how the system works. If you don't know how something works, how are you supposed to diagnose it? Operate the system. Functional. Do Go bi-directional. Use a scanner. If you can't use a scanner, then figure out some sort of dynamic test that you can run to actually figure out what's wrong with the car. Okay? Perfect example. Um, one, of the, one of our students had a car not too long ago that he brought in, and the complaint was that lights were dim, uh, particularly on diesel. So when we went ahead and tested the car, we did a dynamic test. We put our oscilloscope across the battery, started up the car, saw voltage drop, and then we saw the alternator begin to charge up, but it was charging pretty weak. Then when we did a voltage drop test on the terminals, we got almost seven volts drop. What was super crazy is ground to the battery case, we got about eight volts. So that means we had, we had voltage charge on the plastic case of the battery. So we recommended a battery. And long behold, guess what took care of the problem? Battery and cleaning the actual terminals. So you got to make sure that you know how the system works and how to operate it so you can test it. Come up with some possible causes. What are some things that might be causing this type of problem and how can you diagnose that? Once you kind of narrowed it down to a certain area, stay there. Okay. One thing you want to remember with drivability concerns, it's usually one of three things. Air fuel, mechanical or ignition okay if i run some general tests i'll give you an example of a car comes in with the p0101 mass airflow code i'll run a volumetric efficiency test why that's a general test that's going to help me get in the area of where i need to diagnose is this a breathing problem a false breathing problem or is this a fuel delivery problem that one test is going to help me get all that information down so this is why we need to kind of isolate it to where is this problem actually at then you want to know the problem area. How does the system work? How can I test it? Once you get it down to that area, then you're going to run some tests. Okay. Usually by then, I've already done about half an hour of diag work just on paper. Then I go run two, three, four tests, and then I get an idea of what I need to do to fix the car. After that, you want to verify, okay, these tests gave me these results, and this is what I'm deciding to go with for my repair. Then do your repair. And the last step that bugs the crap out of me, because most shops don't do this, is verify the repair. What a lot of shops say is, I don't get paid for that. I don't get paid for test driving. Really? Well, then what are you going to do? Give the key back to the customer, let the customer do the test drive and verification. And then when it doesn't fix the problem, then, you, then the customer comes back. Then you get mad at the customer. No, they're paying you for a diag. Your diag should include that verification. It's not the customer's fault that you don't know how to charge, and it's not the customer's fault that you are not properly doing what you should, which is verifying the actual repair. So you rerun the same test you did to, to find the concern, and then that's how you're going to verify if your repair was done successfully. Don't let the customer do it. That's why they come back pretty pissed off. Okay, another thing we need to verify, is this really a concern or is this a complaint? Okay. There's a difference. So a concern is something that interests you because it is important or an effect to you. The check engine lights on with a rough idle is a concern for this particular car. All right, so here we got a check engine light on and we actually have a rough idle. So that right there is letting us know we really have a concern. However, on the other hand is we have a complaint. A complaint is an objection to something that is unfair, unacceptable, or otherwise not up to normal standards. The customer complains about noise that their new mud terrain tires are making. So if a car comes in, right, and you just installed some mud terrain tires, a guy takes off, a week later comes back and says, hey man, my car's making this weird humming noise. Yeah, that's a complaint. There's not much you could do there, okay? So what I tell my students is this. If it's a concern, that means that there's something going to be associated with it that you can verify. And a complaint is gonna be something you're probably gonna look up in the owner's manual. I'll give you guys another example. I had a Ford that came in one time, customer's complaint is, I cannot adjust my volume control until after 50 miles an hour. Okay. Well, I said, well, that's a good one, right? What would most shops have done? Sold them a radio. You know what the, 
And you know what the real problem was? Is the setting on his key, or he was actually using his son's key. So the key setting, or my, my key technology from Ford, had the radio programmed at a certain decimal level, so he couldn't actually move it. Now, like I said, what would some shops do? Sell them a radio, sell them a BCM, sell them keys. Why? All I had to do was look at it and say, hey, this is more of a complaint. I looked in the owner's manual and kind of explained to the customer, and we just charged them for educating him on his particular car. So you need to make that, that uh, distinction. Is this really a concern, or is this a customer complaint? Okay. One of the things you guys want to remember is always start with the basics. What I mean by the basics is one of the first ones is your SOC, your state of charge. Okay, Like you guys are all aware, a battery has six cells with 2.1 volts each, which gives us a total of 12.6 volts. A 12.6 volt battery is at a 100% state of charge. Okay, A zero or a dead battery is 11.9 volts. You have 600 millivolts difference between a dead battery and a fully charged battery. Let that soak in. Okay. I started in a shop where I was told that 12 volts was optimal, was perfect. And that's not true. If you get a car that comes in with 12.0, the battery's dead. Don't, don't waste your time. Okay. One rule of thumb for me is 12.4. Anything below 12.4, put that battery on a charger and then call me when it's at 12.4 or higher, and then we'll diagnose it. Why? I've had cars that will give you a lot of problems because the battery's weak. Okay, one of my mentors talks about a thing called load shedding, which is a real thing, okay, uh, which has happened in one of my personal vehicles. Uh, back in the day, I was driving down, I had an expedition. And as I was driving, I had no indicators on the dash, but first thing I lost was my my media system. Right after that, I lost air conditioning. Right after that, then I lost my audio, and then that's when the truck completely died. Come to find out, it was a bad alternator. So the system just started shutting down things that were not important to the vehicle, such as subsystems, such as air conditioning, and the infotainment system, to try to maintain enough voltage for the primary stuff such as fuel pump coils and all that fun stuff okay so you might be chasing your butt if you got a car that has 12 volts on the battery and yet you're trying to do a diagnosis so always make sure you guys start with the basics 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 so here what we're seeing is we're actually seeing a quick test that we normally do and this is a battery test this test is an amazing test that should be performed so this way you guys have an idea of how is this system operating so while cranking the vehicle, my oscilloscope was connected across the battery, plus positive and negative. And when we crank the vehicle, we should get no less than 9.6 volts drop, okay, if you're using a voltmeter, or 8.5 volts if you're using a scope. And the reason why the scope is actually 1 volt less is because the scope is much faster than an actual DVOM. So your DVOM is 9.6, and it's 9.5 or 9, uh, excuse me, 8.5 or 8.6 on your lab scope. So if you guys are looking at my screen here, notice how our source voltage was a little bit above 12 volts, about 12 and a half. When I started the vehicle, we had a inrush of voltage, so voltage dropped. Then after that, what we're seeing here in this area right here, this could be our relative compression, right? Or this is called CEMF, counter electric motor force, okay? Then we're going to have some exaltation of the alternator. Alternator kicks on and begins to actually charge. Okay, so this right here, this one test verified battery, engine's ability or starter's ability to turn, and alternator. One test was able to test three different systems. I still don't get it why some technicians refuse to do these types of tests. Okay, this test right here really let me know that battery was good, starter was good, and my alternator is good and it's actually charging. Okay, and I could see all that with one scope capture. All right, so uh, if you guys already took my electrical class or see my electrical video, here's just a quick refresher. ASC will be covering some voltage stuff, so might as well go ahead and, and chat about it. So volts, anytime we're talking about volts or voltage, voltage is going to be electrical pressure or potential, okay? So if you put your voltmeter across the battery, that gives you 12 volts, okay? That means that battery, that battery has a potential of giving you 12 volts of pressure, okay? 
It doesn't mean that, oh, uh, I've had a lot of people tell me, hey, well, it's showing voltage, um, everything's good. That doesn't mean anything. If you have voltage there, that's great. That means you have the potential of doing something. That doesn't mean you're actually doing it. That's when current comes in, okay? So here with amps, whoops, got a little excited. So amps or amperage describes how much current is flowing at a given point in a given amount of time when work is being performed. Okay, for my students, we always teach that it's way better to test for current. Why? Because current is going to let you know if the circuit's working and if the resistance value within that circuit has changed. Okay, and one, one way to remember this is the highway. Okay, if you're going down the highway and traffic begins to build up, traffic is resistance. If resistance begins to build up, can your speed increase? The answer is no. So your speed on the vehicle is going to decrease, which is current. So if resistance goes up or traffic, that means your speed is going to go down. And the opposite, if there is zero traffic and you're on the highway at 2 a.m., can you hit 100 miles an hour? Absolutely. Why? Because there's no resistance. So whenever you lose resistance within the circuit or you have a short circuit, that would mean that you can have a blown fuse because current went up. So if resistance goes down, current goes up, right? And vice versa. Okay, so you want to remember that when it comes to amperage. And the next one, the next one is resistance. When we're talking about resistance, we're simply talking about anything that impedes the flow of current. Okay. So resistance would be anything such as corrosion, loose connection, right? And we need all three of these to be able to calculate one of the other. So that leads us into Ohm's law. So for Ohm's law, if we want to figure out voltage, I need resistance and amperage in order to give me voltage. If I have voltage and amperage, I'll be able to calculate resistance, okay? So looking at our diagram here, we have a 12 volt battery with four ohms of resistance. Four goes into 12, three times. So that means this closed series circuit draws three amps anywhere throughout the circuit. All right, so continuing here with Ohm's law, we see we have a series circuit. Always remember in a series circuit, all resistances add for a total and current is the same everywhere. So if you guys can see, we have a 12 volt battery, we got a fuse and a switch. We got two loads here. One is three ohms of resistance and the other one's nine ohms of resistance. We add that together, that's 12 ohms. 12 volts, 12 ohms, one amp. Notice how we have one amp of draw no matter where we put our meter. So now if I want to figure out what the voltage drop or voltage consumption is going to be of the first load, this load is going to consume three volts. And how do we know that? It has three ohms of resistance. And if I want to find out voltage, I multiply resistance and amperage to figure out voltage. So three ohms, one amp gives me three volts. So I know I have a three volt voltage drop. So if I subtract three from 12, that leaves me with nine. Following over to my second load, that's 9 ohms of resistance, 1 amp. 9 times 1 is 9 volts. So here what you can see is 9 volts, all right? If we had 12 minus 3, that gives you 9, so now you have 9 volts. After that, you should show 0. Why? Because that's your ground circuit. If you guys are diagnosing an electrical system, just like what you guys can see here, and you guys notice that you're supposed to have 3 volts and 9 volts, when you go do a voltage drop on the last load and you notice that it's only seven volts instead of the actual nine, then at that point, you know that you actually have an electrical fault. So this is why it's super important to understand what the voltage drops are and how to actually use Ohm's law within an electrical circuit. So the next one we're looking at here, whoops, got a little excited. So the next one we're looking at here is a parallel circuit. So with the parallel circuit, it's a little bit different. Why? Because it's not sharing the 12 volts amongst the entire circuit. What it's actually doing is each one of these individual branches is going to be having its own 12 volts. Then depending on the resistance value within each resistance of each branch, is gonna determine how much current they're going to be drawing. So the first one, you see we have two ohms of resistance and a 12 volt circuit. Two ohms goes into 12, six, so we have a six amp, six amp draw. On the next one, it's six ohms, 12 volts gives you a two amp draw. And then on the next one, we have a 12 ohm resistor, 12 volts gives you one amp of draw. Now, if we measure current, if I measure current for total of the circuit, that's going to give me nine amps. But this nine comes from six, two, 
one and those three together for the entire circuit is going to draw nine amps but if i go to each branch individually that's where i'm going to be able to see that one's drawing six the other's drawing two and the other is drawing one So like I was telling you guys earlier, always keep in mind that current and resistance work in conjunction. If resistance goes up, then amperage goes down. So if your, tra if your um, traffic goes up, then that means your speed will go down. And if your traffic goes down, that means your speed will go up. So always remember that they work in conjunction. One goes up, the other goes down. So if resistance goes up, that slows the flow of electrons. So current goes down if resistance goes down that means that current goes up that's why we blow fuses because we have a path of least resistance or less resistance which then increases amperage so continuing with general diagnosis always remember that you have voltage drop a voltage drop on a ground circuit should be about two tenths of a volt or less the voltage drop from battery positive to the starter is about 300 millivolts and the positive um, battery battery positive and alternator output should be about 300 millivolts battery post to terminal 200 and across the solenoid is a starter solenoid is 200 millivolts all right so let's start with some basic engine uh general diagnosis so one thing that i teach uh, quite a bit because it helped me a lot when I was in it when I was starting was engine vacuum uh, This is one of those tests that a lot of technicians no longer do because they say it's too old or antiquated It's actually a really good test and a really easy test to do um, And then I get those texts that say yeah, I want to learn how to use that delta pressure sensor on the vacuum um, You don't need to do that. You can also see that with a vacuum gauge um, now we're technicians, so most of us are visual kinesthetic learners, means we need to see it, do it, and that's how we're gonna learn it. So when it comes to engine vacuum, it's always a good idea to start with some older cars. You can grab a vacuum gauge, but don't grab any vacuum gauge, okay? Here, here's a trick to it. You need to learn how your vacuum gauge operates. Why? Because they're all a little bit different. Some are mistreated, some are not. Some have a hose that goes from here to the moon, some have a short one, okay? It all depends how you run your rig. Oscilloscopes, same thing. It's your scope. You set it up how you want. You might not like how I set it up, and that's okay, because that's what scopes are for. Scan tools, same thing, okay? So with engine vacuum, you want to use a centralized vacuum port. One of the one that I was taught and works very well for me is the purge valve. Wherever the purge valve is located is usually going to be a centralized vacuum connection, because we need to evenly distribute that fuel amongst the cylinders once we actually purge the system. So once you do that, remove that hose, plug your vacuum gauge into the port or the nipple, and then you should be reading a steady 18 to 22 inches of vacuum, or 17 to 21 inches, depending on what book you read and who taught you. Okay, don't kill me in the comments because of that. You lose one inch of vacuum for every 1,000 feet of elevation gain. Here in Southern California, we're at about 1,400 feet elevation. If we want to round that down to about 1,000 feet, um, that means that we are going to be somewhere between 17 and 21 inches of vacuum. Now, if I was up in Big Bear uh, here in Southern California, which is about 8,000 feet elevation, okay, that's going to put us somewhere between 10 and 16 inches of vacuum, if my math serves me right, which most of the time doesn't. Um, so that right there would let me know that the engine's ability to breathe is going to be a lot different at a denser altitude than down here. Okay, so that's important for me to understand that. Now, one of the simple tests we could do is we put a vacuum gauge and we can see that we're getting a one inch drop, okay? Um, that's usually going to be indication of a valve seating problem. So if you see it do boom, 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 it's gonna be a valve seating problem. Okay, another thing you can actually do um, is the dollar bill test. Grab a dollar bill, slam it in the exhaust. If you have all cylinders contributing properly, they're going to be puffing out pressure into the exhaust. That dollar bill should be out the entire time. If every so often you see a suck back, okay, that means that you had a cylinder that didn't contribute and usually going to be indicative of a valve problem. Okay, so keep that in mind. 
The other test we could do is if we have a slight vibration, okay, slightly below normal, and the needle gauge will vibrate rapidly at idle and then stabilize at high speeds, is going to be a worn intake valve guide, okay? So what you're gonna do is if the car, if you're watching your vacuum gauge at idle and you see the, the needle doing this, and then once you bring it up to about 2000 RPM, it stables off, and that's gonna tell you that you have a worn valve guide. Uh, from what my students are reporting back, there is quite a bit of questions on this on the A8. So just keep this in mind and you guys can go back to this if you, if you need more help on it. This way um, you guys can get it down packed. Also, I recommend that don't only use this information just for the ASC. This is actually stuff that I use in my diagnostic strategies and I teach in my diagnostic class. So this is not anything that's just for a test and then forget about it. This is for something you guys need to pick up master for the test but also make sure you're applying this because these tests are really going to help you guys be able to test vehicles and properly diagnose and repair cars okay so if i have a, an intake vacuum leak okay usually i'm going to see about a steady three to nine inches somewhere in that range all right we used to use blah, we used to use this and see this a lot back in the old day when we had vehicles with ac systems that were operated with vacuum controls okay now we just use smoke machines but that was one of the ways we used to check back in the day. Um, and propane rigs were a, a, a wonder back then, which I still use my propane rig today. All right, if you have a valve spring problem, you wanna increase the engine speed to about 2000 RPM and check for weak or broken valve springs. If the, if the vacuum gauge needle fluctuates rapidly between 12 and 24 inches of vacuum, okay, then that's usually gonna indicate you have a, a weak valve spring. Another way that we can actually do this is by doing secondary ignition. With secondary ignition, if you guys have taken any type of secondary ignition class or if you guys have studied it on your own, KV is gonna be our indicator of actual compression. So one thing that you can actually do is bring the RPM up to about 2000 RPM and then let it go. And when that happens, that throttle is gonna come back and shut off and we should have a spike in KV. And if we have a one cylinder that takes a little while longer to boop, 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 spike up, then that's usually gonna be indicative of a valve spring problem. And so you can also see that in secondary ignition. And if we have a restricted exhaust, one of the ways that I test for, and I was taught to test for it, and it's worked very well for me, is you plug your vacuum gauge in, start the engine, let it come to normal speed, and then you're gonna do a wide open or a snap throttle. What's happening here is we're actually going to three two you're gonna snap the throttle vacuum should drop to zero because there's so much inrush of air that intake manifold and atmospheric pressure are equal so you're gonna see zero and then it's gonna come back over your your steady vacuum and then stable back off at your normal vacuum that's a normal engine operation now if the exhaust is restricted what you're gonna see is instead of vacuum dropping off to zero vacuum is actually going to increase so as vacuum begins to increase, then it's gonna come back off to normal. That's telling you that you have a restricted exhaust. Exhaust is actually not flowing out the tailpipe, which is why it's actually increasing in vacuum. Keep that in mind. Okay. Actually, let me go back real quick. Um, here in my class, I actually taught my students to use an in-cylinder pressure transducer. So this test only works if you have one cap. If you got a car that has multiple banks and multiple cats, then an in-cylinder pressure waveform would probably be your best bet. What you're going to do is if you have a V-style engine with two banks of cats and you suspect one bank to be plugged or restricted, pull the plug on that side, drop in a transducer, run a test. Remember your exhaust plateau needs to be relatively even at atmospheric pressure. If you begin to see it actually curve up or ramp up and then come back down into vacuum, that's usually going to be indicative of restricted exhaust. So if you have a vehicle that has multiple banks, this is how you're going to figure out um, which bank is actually the one that has the restricted exhaust. So you guys are seeing here, this is actually a test that we teach and we use quite often here during class. This is a relative compression test or an RC test. So one thing that I teach in diagnostics is you got to know the difference between a general test and a pinpoint test or how are you using this test. And what I mean by that is this relative compression test gives me a general idea of how well the engine is doing. 
Okay, so when a car comes in and it has a misfire, this is the first test I actually run. Why? Because if it shows that I have a weak cylinder, why am I gonna waste my time on fuel and ignition? I need to now run pinpoint tests to determine which cylinder is bad and why is it bad. Okay, so run an RC test to quickly determine if you have a weak cylinder. One other thing is listen for it, okay? I can't tell you guys how many times I get called to diagnostics or a diag at a shop and I show up and I go to hit the key and instead of hearing a ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta engine cadence, I hear ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-
all point to a bad mechanical issue, then you're gonna follow that up with a pinpoint test. This pinpoint test is a leak down test. What you guys are seeing here is we have a leak down tester connected to the cylinder. You're gonna put raise the cylinder, top dead center compression, both intake and exhaust valves closed, and then you're gonna introduce shop air. Um, I put a good scale on here for you guys. If the reading's good, it's usually be doing zero and 10%. Fair would be 10 to 20%, poor is 20 to 30, and it failed if it's anything above 30%. For a cylinder that's more than 20%, uh, pinpoint the cause. It could be air escaping through the intake valve, exhaust valve, or PCV system. So whenever you guys are doing a leak down test, okay, there's going to be shop air being introduced into the cylinder. It has to go somewhere. So if you're getting more than a 20% loss at this point, now you need to figure out where is this air going? First thing you're gonna do is you're gonna remove the boot for the air intake and see if you can hear air coming out of the throttle plate. And if you do, it's a bad intake valve, okay? Next one would be pull a dipstick or remove the oil cap. If you have a bunch of air coming through there, that means you got bad piston rings, okay? Then the last one, we take a glove and shove it over the exhaust and if that glove begins to inflate, we know we got an exhaust valve that's not sealing properly, and now we can um, pull the valve cover off if we still have diagnostic time. If not, at this point, we can ask the customer for a teardown, um, and then we can pinpoint and tell them exactly why that problem is occurring. Um, one that I forgot to mention was bubbles in the coolant. You're also going to take the radiator cap off, and if you have bubbles in the coolant, that means you have a blown head gasket or a cracked block. Okay. Um, one thing that I learned not too long ago from PJ Walter was test it bottom dead center, okay? Um, I didn't really touch on this, and the reason why is because this is going to be counterintuitive to anything we teach you in any class, plus it's not going to fit with ASC testing, but one way that you guys can actually test for a cylinder, that a bore that might be damaged, is put the cylinder on bottom dead center with both valves closed and then do a leak down test. Because now if you're getting bubbles, then there's a high probability that it might actually be the cylinder walls, not the actual cylinder head. Okay, just a word of advice there. All right. This, this next part that I'm going to be talking about is five gas analysis or emission diagnosing. And to me, this is actually a great tool to use, uh, even though a lot of technicians say, oh, no, it's old technology. You shouldn't be doing that. Um, it works and I love using a five gas analyzer anytime I possibly can. I love teaching it because it makes diagnosing that much more easy, especially when you guys are a drivability tech that all you do is fix cars that aren't running properly that nobody else can fix. Five gas analyzer is gonna be your best friend. So analyzing air and fuel, air is made up of nitrogen and oxygen and fuel is made up of hydrogen and carbon. Those two get drawn into the cylinder, they get compressed and then they get ignited. Once they get ignited, then we're going to have some exhaust gases that are going to be changing as elements. So we're going to have H2O, we're going to have water coming out of the exhaust. So the small droplets you guys see is absolutely normal. The old rule of thumb is for every one liter of fuel, you're going to get one liter of water. Okay, so for every one hour of fuel burned is how much um, water you're supposed to see in the exhaust. Now, if the engine's not prop running properly, you're going to have some hydrocarbons left over. Typically, all the new cars I've seen now are at zero. Uh, carbon dioxide, so that's going to be carbon and oxygen combining to form CO2. When I don't have enough oxygen to form carbon dioxide, I'm going to form carbon monoxide, the silent killer. Okay, And usually, when I don't have enough oxygen, that's indicative to me of I have too much fuel. Okay. So we can't produce CO2, we'll produce carbon monoxide, the one that's going to kill you. Then we have some oxygen left over. And obviously, because we breathe in nitrogen, nitrogen is a gas that responds to temperature and pressure. Nitrogen is going to combine with oxygen, either one, two, or three molecules of oxygen to form NOx. Then NOx is a byproduct of internal combustion that if it mixes with um, HC in sunlight, then it's going to create photochemical smog. So when we're talking about the five gas analyzer, CO2 is a measurement of combustion efficiency. Usually you want to see, oops, you want to see CO2 about 13 to 15%, the higher the better. 
Low CO2 indicates an engine mechanical, fuel, or ignition problem. So if you think it might be a mechanical problem, put a probe in it. Put the emission analyzer probe in it. Start the car and look at CO2. If CO2 is in the tens, nines, you got a pretty bad problem. You got a mechanical fault, okay? Oxygen. Oxygen is also measured in percentage, and it tells us how well the catalytic converter is running efficiency, efficiency-wise, okay? Sealed, oh, excuse me, O2 should be about 0%, okay? And high O2 indicates a lean condition or a misfire. Hydrocarbons is measured in parts per million, okay? And HC is a measurement of raw fuel in the exhaust. So hydrocarbons should be about 50 parts per million or less. And if HC with high O2 uh, and low CO2 would indicate an ignition misfire. High HC and equal O2 and CO2 would usually indicate a mechanical misfire. And like I said earlier, carbon monoxide is when we don't have enough oxygen to create CO2. CO2 is measured in percentage. CO, excuse me, CO is measured in percentage and CO should measure about 0%. Low CO indicates lean. High CO indicates a rich condition. We tested a uh, GDI vehicle the other day and CO was 0. And we were seeing CO2 in the 16s. Um, so it, it's, it's there, okay? Um, NOx is measured in parts per million and NOx is created when nitrogen heats up and expands and combines with oxygen. NOx should be about 250 ppm and anytime temperature increases above 2500 degrees Fahrenheit inside the combustion chamber, that's going to help us increase NOx production so the NOx goes through the roof. That's why we use EGRs and the EGRs help us reduce that amount of, uh, of NOx. All right, so here we have a quick case study. The vehicle has 15.6% CO2, 0% O2, 68% hydrocarbon, 0.11 CO, and then NOx is 141. So what I did here is I plugged them into a lambda calculator. If you guys aren't aware what lambda is, lambda is a measurement of how well the, fuel, the engine is in fuel control using five gas analysis. This is actually a way better uh, method of determining if the vehicle's in fuel control better than actual long-term and short-term fuel trim. This is a European thing. Um, it's getting traction here in the States. I actually teach it and use it quite a bit. Um, and if you guys wanna use the link, you guys could see it right here down below. So if you guys notice our Lambda result is 0.995. So that right there is indicating to me that the vehicle is running rich, not crazily rich, but it is running a little bit on the rich side. Um, if I look at CO, I have 0.11, so that's also verifying that it is running a little bit on the rich side. And then hydrocarbons is also re-edifying that by hydrocarbons being at 68 ppm. So that's telling me that there is some unburned fuel left over, and that's letting me know that there's too much to begin with, can't burn it all, so I have some left over. Okay, so that right there is letting me know that I might have a small misfire, okay, uh, or a fuel delivery issue, one of the two. So the vehicle has a mill on, PO300 DTC, okay, and is it, and let's take a look. CO2 is at 10%, O2 is 3.5, hydrocarbons is 320, CO is at 0.11, and then NOx is at 42. Our Lambda calculator is letting us know we have a Lambda reading of 1.205, which means this vehicle is excessively lean. It's actually far beyond the normal lean threshold of 1.020. So this is telling me this vehicle is already into a lean misfire situation. So this vehicle here is having um, not really a lean condition. It's just since we're not burning the air fuel mixture, this is why CO2 went up, CO2 dropped, and HCs went up because it's not being consumed. So it's going right out the tailpipe the same way it went in. So this is why we're getting what's called a false lean condition. This is why it's important to understand, is this really the cause of the problem or is this an effect of the actual problem, okay? All right, ignition system, diag and repair. Whoops. So misfire DTCs and HC emission failures are attributed to one of three things. It's either a mechanical problem, an ignition problem, or a fuel problem. Okay, that's about it. It, it can't be anything other than that. Well, 
It can. I don't want to say can't. It can be something other than that. However, about 98% of the time, it's one of these three things. Okay. So engine mechanical can be determined quickly by a general test, like an RC test. After mechanical general test, if it seems normal, move on to the next area, which would be ignition. So this is what I'm referring to. Car comes in and it has a misfire. Instead of you guys going and grabbing tools, taking the intake off just to swap coils, and then if that doesn't work, then it's like, now what? Uh, why not just run an RC test? Connect an amp clamp and positive negative across the battery and run the test. Now, if you notice that one of your humps is smaller than the other, you know it's a mechanical problem. Don't waste your time testing everything else because it's mechanical. That, does, does that make sense? Okay. Um, if, those, if that general test comes out normal, then that means it's not a mechanical problem. Then move on to the next thing, which would be ignition. Okay. So with ignition, there's multiple tests you guys can actually run. Um, if you still have a vehicle that has distributor and coil, then you can just plug on to the coil side, primary side, and then secondary off of the coil, and then watch for a, an event that might determine which cylinder is the one misfiring. And if you have a newer car uh, with coil on plug or intelligent coil on plug, then you're going to have to do a test like you guys are seeing on the screen right now. What I'm seeing, what I'm doing here is that I'm testing the primary side of the coil using a current clamp. So my current probe is actually clamped around the coil and I'm actually checking for current saturation. Did this coil, is this coil shorted on the primary side and is it able to produce enough voltage for the secondary side? So what I can see here is that it didn't have a short. And the reason I say that is because usually if the coil shorted, that means less resistance, so this is going to shoot automatically up and then ramp off. Because it didn't shoot up, that's telling me that it's not shorted, and this primary side should be able to create enough energy for the secondary side. Here, I'm looking at a non-intelligent coil where I took a back probe and back probe the, the ground side of the coil, and I'm also getting this same waveform. Okay. So this is the same thing, we're just looking at it in uh, different parts of it. This is current or amperage, and this is voltage, okay? So that's how, that's why we can do it either way. Again, this test that, I'm, that you're seeing right now on the screen, the primary side and this type of waveform can only be done on a non-intelligent two-wire coil. If your coil has more than two wires, you cannot run this test. You gotta do this one, okay? Keep that in mind. So what you guys are seeing here is here we can see that the dwell time, so this is coil saturation, and then here the coil gets turned off, energy gets built to overcome or ionize the air gap of the coil, then energy begins to shoot across the actual spark plug gap, and then some coil oscillations and the uh, waveform begins all over again. So here you're looking at the primary side of an ignition system. This is a superimposed pattern. This voltage trace for all cylinders are displayed one on top of each other. So if you have one that's really bad, it's going to stand out. Okay. So on the primary side, which is the low voltage side of the coil, we're looking at the firing section. That includes firing KV and burn time. This whole area right here would be the firing section. Section immediately after that where the nose begins, coil oscillation, and then right before dwell is known as our inter intermediate section. And then following that is our dwell section, the amount of time that the coil is actually on, saturating to create energy. So let's take a look here at our primary side of an ignition coil. So part A right here is turned on, coil is turned on, saturating the primary side. Part B, current limiting. So we don't want to produce too much current. So what the system's actually doing is it's turning off the transistor to the coil. So the coil stops producing energy. Then right after that at C, we actually turn it off completely. Then what do we get? We get a rush or a spike of voltage. Um, and that's absorbed into the secondary side. So right here you're watching this, the primary being turned off and being absorbed to secondary. At part D is where the voltage required to begin to ionize the actual spark plug gap. Okay, so what happens is we have to create a bunch of voltage to be able to jump all the compression and that 30 thousandths gap uh, between the electrode and the plug tip. Then it's not just it shoots across, right? It has to create enough energy to be able to begin to arc. And then once it actually starts arcing, that's when we begin to get the burn time. 
So part E, voltage stabilizes from 200 to a few thousand volts where plasma is created and then spark begins to travel across the spark plug electrode. Part F is our burn time. So if you have an upward, that indicates a lean condition. So if you see it start from point E and just go straight up, that means that there's no hydrocarbons inside the combustion chamber. So it can't produce, or excuse me, it can't um, create what's called conductivity because we don't have a wire or a circuit inside the combustion chamber. We have to create that plasma and we need that hydrocarbons for us to create conductivity. If we don't have that, then voltage is just going to shoot up because it doesn't have a path back to ground through that compressed hydrocarbon. And then if you get a downward spike, then that's a downward ramp. That means there's too much fuel, so we can't properly burn it. And usually you're going to get a downward spike and it's going to be a lot longer. The reason why it's a lot longer is because it needs to burn longer to burn all that air fuel mixture inside the combustion chamber. And looking at, at F, your burn time should be a 1.0 to 1.5 on a coil on plug system. So if you got a vehicle that has coil on plug, you should see 1.0 to 1.5 burn time. Okay. A lot of people ask me, what about KV? It doesn't matter. Burn time. If burn time gets longer, KV gets shorter. If KV gets longer, burn time gets shorter. Okay. It's just, if I have 12 inches of rope, and I lift up eight inches, that's gonna only give me two inches left over. But if I pull it nine inches, that's only gonna give me one inch left over, okay? So think about it that way. If KV goes up, burn time gets shorter. If KV goes down, burn time gets longer, okay? Another thing you always wanna do is split the burn time in half. If you split the burn time in half, any issues to the left-hand side Okay, is going to be indicative of a problem external of the combustion chamber. Anything on the right hand side is indicative of a problem internal of the combustion chamber. So let's say if we're looking at this graph here and this KV is just off the chart and I have very little burn time. Where's the problem? The problem is external to the combustion chamber. So that's going to be spark plug wire, cap, rotor, coil boot, or the coil itself. Now, if I'm looking at it and I split it in half and um, right after about the halfway mark, I just begin to see some very violent hash, okay? What is that telling me? I have a problem internal to the combustion chamber, which is probably going to be a valve problem, okay? Why? Because if the voltage goes up, that means if it uh, lost fuel and if it goes down, it found fuel. So if I start to see a big hash, that means no fuel, found fuel, no fuel, found fuel, no fuel, found fuel, no fuel, found fuel. The only way they can create that is if I get some turbulence because of a valve that's not seating properly. Okay. <coughs> On point G, we call it the nose. If you don't have a nose, no spark event happened in the cylinder. That means something happened where it, it, there was an event of spark, but it didn't happen in the combustion chamber. And part H is a remaining energy that's not strong enough to continue to burn, but it just begins to dissipate. You usually want to see about two, okay, of those little hash marks or little humps. That's going to be an indication that um, the coil filed properly and everything went to plant, okay? So the firing line should jump abruptly at the moment the throttle is open and then return to the previous level at idle. So if you have your KV there, right? and you go and snap the throttle, then you should get a increase and then it's gonna come back down to normal, right? If you get one that when you go to snap it, you have one that takes a little bit longer, it comes up, but then it, it like half a second later than the rest of them to come back down and then it does a th -th 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 valve guide or valve spring, okay? If you go and you hit the throttle and you have no KV change, um, in that cylinder, that means that cylinder didn't change. So that means you didn't get an inrush of air. So that's why compression didn't change. So you probably got an intake timing problem or an intake valve problem on that particular cylinder. So what you want to do is you want to raise RPM to 2,500 RPM, then quickly release the throttle. If one cylinder KV drops later than the others after snapping the throttle closed, then you have a weak valve spring. Okay. Just remember it that way. 
If you're getting a firing KV that keeps getting larger and shorter, okay, what does that mean? All right, think about it. Can your spark plug, uh, can the coil boot and the coil itself get longer and shorter? No. So if KV is going bam, 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 okay, that's telling you that you got a valve problem. You more than likely got a burnt valve. The reason why is because, remember, valves spin as they go up and down inside their guide. So if I have compression that goes up and then compression goes low and then compression goes a little bit up but then lower but then high, okay, that's meaning that the, as the valve spins, then it's leaking at some points, okay? So that's one way that you can actually see that as well. The spark plug wire and coil boot are not getting longer or shorter, so you have a carbon valve or a burnt valve, one of the two. Now, that's a general test, so now you got to do a pinpoint test to figure out if you really have a problem there and what the problem is. All right, so after we check all the ignition system, if all that's okay, the next thing we got to look at is air fuel, right? So some vehicles are equipped with speed density and some are equipped with mass airflow. What's the difference? So a speed density system uses a MAP sensor and the manifold absolute pressure sensor and that sensor is going to be detecting engine vacuum. Engine vacuum is a good indicator of engine load. So if I have no vacuum, that means the engine's under high load. If I have high vacuum, then that means that the engine's at low speed, right? And if I have no vacuum, that means the engine's at high speed. So this is a way a good way for the computer to determine is this vehicle under load or not? This is why when the vehicle has a speed density system, it's always important to verify that the vacuum line to the, the sensor is actually present and not cracked or fallen off. Because at that point, what you could see is if you see 4.5 volts or near um, atmospheric pressure, then that's how you know that that sensor is actually not reading manifold vacuum. And then some vehicles use a mass airflow. Mass airflow has, depending on the system, some use a hot wire, which sends a small amount of current through a small little wire. As air flows through that wire, it cools it down, so the computer is paying attention at how much current it needs to maintain a certain temperature, and that's how the computer knows how much incoming air is actually coming into the engine. So the speed density system measures intake airflow by sensing changes in the intake manifold using a pressure type sensor. For those are guys that are advanced scope users, some of you guys might be using a MAP sensor with a 5 volt reference box as a delta pressure sensor, excuse me, an absolute pressure sensor. So you're using it to measure vacuum, exhaust pulses. You could do that with a MAP sensor. So if you guys have a known good one that's laying around and you have a pigtail for it, you can make that into a pressure tester. And the mass airflow, um, like I was saying, measures air volume and density based off of how much current it needs to maintain that certain temperature on that particular hot wire. So one thing you always want to remember when it comes to using a mass airflow sensor is what is a normal reading? A lot of people always ask me, what's normal? What's normal? Well, first of all, you guys should always be looking at known good cars. And yes, I know some of you guys are going to say, I don't have the time for that, blah, 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 but you do. And so car comes in, you guys are servicing it, and then you have to go for a test drive. Well, plug in your scanner, take it for a test drive, record all that data. Obviously, you're not going to come back and review it, but save it. And then when you have time, because you guys have time, go back and relook at the data. And this way you start picking up what is good, so this way when a bad car comes in, it's going to slap you in the face. However, if you don't have any of that, here's a good way of doing it. The old one-to-one -one ratio. For every one liter of air, excuse me, for every one liter of engine size, you should get one liter of air. Okay, so if we got a 5.4 liter engine, we should be getting how much air, incoming air? Five around five four five five somewhere around six would be max right okay so that's a good way to remember it this doesn't work though on kia hyundai just keep that in mind so because of that the mass airflow sensor can actually cause some issues if the sensor is underestimating or overestimating overestimating the amount of incoming air so one thing that we look at is total fuel trim if you guys haven't been taught uh, taught total trim i'm going to give you guys a quick breakdown of it so total fuel trim is when you add short-term and long-term fuel trim together, and that's actually how the PCM is determining how well the engine is actually running for air-fuel ratio. So if I add short-term and long-term fuel trim together, right, plus or minus 10% is okay. So if I add them together and I'm at plus 8, I'm okay. It is a little bit on the high side, but I'm okay. 
what we want to see optimal wise is short term and long term fuel trim added together giving us plus or minus 5%. That's what we want to see on a good on a good vehicle. Always keep in mind that when you have a plus fuel trim, then that means that the vehicle's running lean cuz it's compensating for it. This is where a lot of technicians have trouble because they say, "Well, the vehicle's plus fuel trim. What do you mean it's lean?" Well, that's a compensation. That is an effect of the problem, not the actual cause. And if you see a lean condition, excuse me, if you see a negative fuel trim, that means that the vehicle is running rich, so the computer's trying to back off some of that fuel, so this way we can get the fuel back into stoichiometric, okay? So remember that. If it's negative, it's running rich. If it's positive, it's running lean, okay? So here's a good, a good chart. Uh, this is something that I go over with my students. Uh, I also included an alpha fuel trim for Nissans because sometimes it does get stupid confusing and excuse my French so if we have zero fuel trim we also have 100% alpha if I have plus 5% fuel trim on a standard car that would reflect as 105 on alpha or if I have negative 10% because I'm taking away 10% fuel because it's running rich that would show a 90 alpha okay so this way you guys can remember this in case you guys get a Nissan outside of ASC if you get a Nissan that comes in for a diagnosis and you see that Nissan's at a 120 alpha fuel trim, you know it's actually running at 15% fuel trim. Okay, so keep that in mind. So mechanical ignition systems both passed. Now what do you do, right? So I like quick and easy tests. If you guys know me and you guys have attended my classes, it's got to be quick and easy. And the reason being is if it's long, cumbersome, and hard, you're not going to do it. And you could sit here all day long, talk to me blue in the face that you're going to do it. You're not. Okay. And how do I know that? Case in point, compression. How many of you guys actually run a compression test when a car comes in with a misfire? Exactly. So that's the reason why I know that if it's a hard test, you're not going to do it. Okay. So I'd always start with sensor data, PIDs, before I move into anything else that's going to take more time to actually run. Okay. And what are some good PIDs to review? So let's take a look. So what are some good PIDs to review? One of them would be fuel trims, right? If I want to take a look at fuel trims, how are my trims doing? Are they positive? Are they negative? Are they within 10%? Are they within 5%? Are they at 30%? All that information is super important. Also, when the car is idling, why not look at mass airflow or MAP sensor, right? If mass, my mass airflow, if the vehicle is a 5.4 and I'm showing 2.3 grams a second, that's a problem. That means that the vehicle is underestimating the amount of air and that's going to give us a fault. What about engine coolant temp? Okay, so the, those are some of the PIDs you want to start getting the habit of actually looking at. The other thing that I always tell my students is never look at manufacturer specific data when you're doing a drivability diagnosis. So what I mean by that is if you enter the VIN number to actually get to the vehicle information, you might be looking at a substituted value. So remember, manufacturers want the car to run and need the car to run and also the system has the adaptive strategy so your car is going to remember how sensor values work and all that and if you don't believe me grab a new car start it warm it up and then walk out and unplug the engine coolant temp while looking at your scan tool i guarantee you that more than likely about 90 percent of vehicles are going to show the same value with it unplugged why because your car remembered what the value should be and it also looks at the intake air temperature and then it knows what the temperature should be so it's going to substitute it this is why you guys need to be using generic data when you guys are trying to diagnose a drivability fault because generic data cannot be substituted okay so keep that in mind all right so some of the here are some of the gases in combination that is going to indicate a rich condition co is going to go up o2 is going to be minimal CO2 is going to drop, HC is going to go up, and then NOx is going to go down. Okay, this is one good way of remembering it. If it's lean, you're going to have an increase, okay, of O2 depending on how severe the car is. CO is going to be really low. CO2 is going to be low. So if I have high, C high O2, high CO, but low HCs, then that means the car is running lean. And then NOx obviously is going to go up right up until I get to 16 to 1 air fuel ratio. After 16 to 1, it's going to start to uh, go down. And the reason being is because at 16, anything above 16 to 1, the car is suffering from a lean misfire. Okay, so at that point, the 
unburned fuel is going to begin to cool down the combustion chamber and it helps us reduce NOx. If I have a misfire, HC is going to increase, O2 is going to increase, CO2 is going to decrease, CO and NOx are going to decrease. Okay, so this is one way to remember it in case you think you have a misfire. All right, so the good old good old oxygen sensor. When it comes to an O2 sensor, a lot of people think, well, I got a P171, P0171, it must be the O2. No. That means the computer is letting you know that that sensor detected an anomaly. Now it's your responsibility to diagnose it. So the oxygen sensor circuit problems can cause some of the following issues. They can cause increase in injector pulse width. Think about it. If the O2 sensor is faulty or there's an exhaust leak and the O2 is detecting more oxygen, what does the computer think? It sees more oxygen. Obviously, it's lean, dump fuel. So it's going to increase injector pulse width and keep the injectors on longer. And that's going to make it burn more fuel. You might have a poor idle. The car is stumbling a bit, um, rough idle. That could be attributed to an O2 sensor. Hesitation on acceleration. So the moment that you accelerate, if the O2 sensor is responding too slowly, it's going to take a while for the computer to actually receive a signal from the O2, sensing the lean condition for the computer to then compensate with more fuel. That can also lead to a surge on acceleration. High emissions. I've seen O2 sensors cause NOx failures, CO failures, and just because the O2 sensor is maybe 50 milliseconds slower than what it should be. Okay? And then lastly, it can also kill the cat. If the O2 sensor is bad, causes the computer to dump fuel, all that fuel is going to end up inside the converter. Then it's going to kill it, and then most people just swap the converter instead of actually checking what killed it in the first place. Okay? So one of the best ways to evaluate an O2 sensor is using a oscilloscope. Now... I know I'm going to get a lot of trash for this because uh, you can see it from a scan tool. Well, do you guys re re realize that your scan tool has to knock on the door for the computer and say, hey, I need oxygen sensor data. Computer says, oh, crap, looks for the data, shoots it back. Your scan tool receives it, converts it, then puts it on an actual graph. That data is old. Okay, And I could prove this to you because we've done this test in classes. But if you want to be the tech who uses that at scan tool data, go for it. Okay. The problem is, is if you are going to be using that, you need to isolate the PIDs to one or two PIDs max. So this way you can get the fastest refresh rate that you possibly can. Okay. Also, if you guys are using the new fancy wireless stuff, it's even slower. Okay. So keep that in mind. So what you want to look for is you want to look for good amplitude. Amplitude always is what voltage, right? And we want to look at good frequency or our hertz. So anytime we're looking at a normal um, zirconia O2 sensor, you want to see it go from 100 to 800 millivolts, right? With 450 millivolts being the center point, and you want to see it switch from lean to rich at least one to three times per second. Okay. So one of the ways that you can do it is raise the RPM to about 2,000 RPM and watch it on your scanner. And your O2 sensor should switch about one to three times per second, okay? And that's going to indicate that the O2 sensor is okay. Problem is, is most states, including California, if this is an emission repair and you don't scope it, uh, you can get into some serious trouble, okay? So make sure that if you guys are in California or any state that has these types of regulations, New York in case, uh, you guys should be using a DSO or a lap scope to actually check an O2 sensor to condemn it. Okay, so right here what I'm doing is this is a propane enrichment test. So here what I did is I added propane. As you guys can see, the vehicle is running rich. I turned the propane off and then the vehicle begins to come back down to a lean condition. Once I get to the furthest lean condition, I snap the throttle. Okay, when I snap the throttle, we should get an instant rich condition and then I'll go ahead and pause my screen. Then I'm going to put two cursors, one at the lowest point and one at the highest point, and I'm going to read the amount of time it took for that O2 sensor to switch from lean to rich. That reading should be less than 100 milliseconds. If it's not, you got a problem, okay? Um, I share this story a lot. This, I had a Cadillac that came in once, had brand new O2 sensors, uh, diverter valves, it had an air injection code. So most people were telling me, hey, well, it's got to be the pump. I said, well, why? Oh, it has new, new everything, new this, new that. It's like, okay, well, why not test it? We already did. All right, so I had them drop it off, and I tested the vehicle. So when 
first thing in the morning, I got there, started the car up, ran, I ran the air injection. I heard the pump come on, but it still set a code. Um, so me kind of doing some research, I fig- I found out the O2 sensors were the line of defense for the air injection. The computer looks at the O2 sensors to make sure the pump actually came on. So I ran this test. Brand new Bosch O2s failed. They were about 250 milliseconds from lean to rich. I said, this can't be. I reran the test, same thing. So I called the customer. I said, hey, I need you to bring me two AC Delco O2 sensors. It has brand new ones. I don't care. I need two AC Delco sensors. Sensors got there. I swapped them out, reset it. I said, look, let me run the, let the car run its test and we'll test it in the morning. So I got there in the morning, as you guys could probably, as you guys, some of you guys have probably been in this situation. I got there with butterflies in my stomach, uh, kind of dreading it. Like, hopefully this takes care of the problem, right? Because that was the only thing that I found wrong. And uh, being the shop foreman at the time, and then being the only shop in that complex that actually knew what they were doing, um, I had a lot of weight on my shoulders. So I got the car started. I heard the pump come on, ran the test, and about... A minute into it, idle came back down to normal. I said, all right, cool. Fingers crossed, shut the car off, put the scanner on. No pending codes and no codes. And guess what monitor set? Air injection. So it was the 202s that were actually too slow. So by the time they actually detected the pump airflow, the computer said, "Uh uh-uh, no, I don't like this, set a code. Okay, so this is why it's important to understand how does the system work and how can I dynamically test this vehicle? Okay, so again, like I was saying, when it comes to mass airflow, always remember that as airflow increases, current increases. Airflow decreases, current decreases. So air equals amps anytime we're talking about a hot wire mass airflow sensor. And always remember for quick reference, the one to one. For every one liter of engine size, you're going to get one liter of air. Okay, so this is a quick uh, mass airflow test that we ran using a scope. Uh, one thing that you guys want to pay attention to when you guys run this test, this first inrush should pass about three volts. Okay, three and a half should be would be good, but it should pass about three. Then after that, a lot of people ask me why does it come down. Well, think about it. When you snap the throttle, right, air and fuel is going to rush in. But what's going to rush in faster is air. But fuel is going to take longer because it's denser, it's heavier, so it's going to take longer to actually move. So when you snap the throttle, you're going to have a huge inrush of air until the mass, the manifold is full of air. So then what happens is engine speed or airflow speed slows down. Then as the engine catches up, then it comes back up to normal. Okay. So this is what you would want to be seeing if you guys were dealing with a normal hot wire type mass airflow. If you guys have a car, a mass airflow that is a um, digital such as GM, you can actually use a Pico lab scope and it will give you this type of waveform if you set it up to frequency. And then it's going to give you this waveform when you do a snap. This is one of the reasons why I use my Pico when it comes to mass airflow testing, especially if I know it's a digital type mass airflow. Continuing with air with fuel testing, right? I always ask this, would you guys prefer to check fuel pressure or fuel volume? Okay? If you guys said fuel pressure, I'll tell you why I don't recommend it in a bit. I always check for fuel volume. And the reason why is because fuel volume is going to tell me, do I have enough volume of fuel to run this engine? Okay. When we're talking about a fuel pressure regulator, excuse me, or fuel pressure, I'm going to use this lid as an example. So this lid is actually acting as my fuel pressure gauge. My gauge is sitting here and I have a hose connected to my Schrader valve. When fuel comes up to my gauge, right, it's going to stay there and then it stays inside of the fuel line. So it's only going to increase in pressure, never decrease. So if I get a moment where my fuel pump stops delivering fuel, I'm never going to see it on my gauge, right? So this is why I never recommend checking fuel pressure. I always recommend checking fuel volume. I've had vehicles that had perfect fuel pressure, but it had no fuel volume. So if I, if I don't have volume, then there's not going to be enough fuel to actually sustain a running engine. So on a non-modulated fuel pump, you should get one to three pints for every 30 seconds of cranking. Okay. So release the fuel pressure gauge. Here's the easiest way to do it. Around the shop, you guys somewhere have a 16 ounce water bottle, right? You bought it at Costco, Sam's Club, whatever. 16 ounces. You grab that sucker and then empty it out and you're not going to reuse that fuel. 
you put on your fuel gauge and your fuel gauge has a bleed valve get that bleed valve put the hose in the water bottle hold it open and crank it for 10 seconds if i crank it for 10 seconds what should i have okay you should fill up that water bottle within 10 seconds if you don't your weak your fuel pump's weak and it's probably going to need a replacement then you can follow that up with pulling the fuse or the relay for the fuel pump putting an amp clamp and watching it on your scope Check to see how your armature is doing on it. What if the armature is bad on it and you need to replace the fuel pump? Okay, now you have two definitive tests that prove that fuel pump is bad, right? I always like to prove it more than one way. Why? Because what if I tested it wrong the first time? Okay, so before you condemn something, make sure that you run multiple tests to make sure you're getting the same conclusion. Okay. With exhaust restrictions, like I was mentioning before, there's a couple different ways you guys can actually do it. One is you can use a vacuum gauge, snap the throttle and make sure vacuum drops to zero and then comes back up. That's going to tell you that you have a good, no exhaust restriction. The other way would be to do a cylinder, uh, in-cylinder pressure transducer test. So if you guys aren't aware how this is set up, this centerpiece right here, this is the exhaust plateau. So notice that exhaust is measuring zero PSI. Well, that makes sense, right? Because exhaust is not vacuum and it's normal atmospheric pressure. So it should be about zero PSI. This right here is letting me know that I have no exhaust restriction. But what if the moment that I'm looking at this trace, I'm seeing from this point where my mouse is at going all the way up to here and then coming down, that's telling me that gradually pressure is increasing. The only way pressure can increase is if I'm restricting the exhaust. So this is one way for you guys to do it. And this is a good method to use when you have two banks and you want to figure out which bank is the one that's actually restricted. The other way of doing it is if the vehicle has a MAP sensor, MAP, you're going to raise the RPM and hold it about 2,500 RPM. If your MAP sensor continuously shows atmospheric uh, voltage or pressure, what does that mean? That means that the manifold, the intake manifold pressure is equal to atmospheric pressure, which there's no way because vacuum is what? Vacuum is intake manifold pressure minus atmospheric, right? So it's less than. If they're equal, that means that you have an exhaust restriction. So that's another way that you guys can actually take a look at that. All right, so continue. We're going to go at emission system, diag, and repair. So one of the first systems we have is what? Our PCV valve. So the PCV valve's responsibility is to allow the blow-by gases from the crankcase to be recycled back into the intake where we burn them off. Okay. Uh, one thing that we're seeing a lot now, uh, Nissan's having a pretty big problem with their PCV valves. They're giving a lot of lean codes. Uh, guys are throwing air fuel ratios, mass airflow codes. I've seen mass airflow codes for these as well. Okay, so be careful with that. Make sure you guys are properly checking them. So one of the ways that you can actually check a PCV valve is by pulling it off, right? You pull it off and if it's removable, because not all of them are now, so you can remove it and then see if your RPM changes, right? The other way is take the valve off and shake it. Make sure that the plunger inside is actually moving. If it is, it's probably in good condition. Or remove it and put your finger underneath it and see if you're getting vacuum coming out of it, okay? Um, if you guys run into some of the Volkswagens that have a molded PCV valve on the valve cover, we've seen with those is we'll start, customers will come in with a complaint of a, a whistle, right? And it sounds like a belt squeak, but it's actually the PCV system is failed. So now you got vacuum in the whole crankcase. One of the ways you could do this is pull the dipstick and if the squeal goes away, it's a bad PCV. The other way we've done it and we learned this from ATG is using propane around the bell housing. If you run propane around the bell housing and RPM increases, then that propane is actually being drawn in through the, the rear main seal. And that's letting you know that the PCV system is actually shot. Okay, so that's one way you can actually test as well. So here's some of the common codes that you might see for defective PCV system. P101 and a 505, idle air control and a mass airflow. So most shops, if they get a 101, what's going in the car? A mass airflow. Once that doesn't fix it then it's probably O2s. Once that doesn't fix it, then it's maybe a computer. If that doesn't fix it, send it to somebody who's actually gonna check it. That's usually how it works with sucks because it makes the good guys look bad. Okay, here we're looking at a non-enhanced EVAP system. Non-enhanced EVAP systems usually run between 90, uh, 96 to 99. And this system doesn't check for leaks, it only checks for flow. So here we have a flow switch, which I'm circling right here number eight. 
this switch is closed. So in its normal state, the switch is actually closed. And then right here in front of it, it's a purge valve. Look where it's connected to, vacuum. So the moment this purge valve is energized, vacuum now goes through the purge valve, opens this switch, and then pulls everything out of the actual canister. When this switch opens, that's how the computer knows we have flow. Did it actually reach the engine? We don't know, right? System's looking at for flow. Then it's going to look at the O2 sensors to see if they went rich. If they did, the computer knows there was successful flow, and it actually reached the combustion chamber. But if there was any leaks, nothing. Right? This is why on some of the older vehicles during smog inspections or mission inspections, we actually check and test the EVAP system. From there, we went to an enhanced EVAP system. This is a vacuum decay EVAP system. Okay, So this system right here uses a vent solenoid, a perch solenoid, a fuel tank pressure sensor right, to actually test itself. An enhanced EVAP system will test for leaks and it will actually test for flow as well. So the way we break this down is to keep it really simple is the front door at your home, hopefully in theory, is always closed and locked. A perch solenoid is the same thing. Okay, We usually keep it closed until we need to either draw fuel vapors out of the canister or allow vacuum into the system to check it for leaks. So the perch solenoid is going to be your front door, usually closed and will only be open to allow vacuum into the actual system. Your back door, okay, is a vent solenoid. The back door on the vent solenoid is always open, okay? And it's open to allow fresh air in to push vapors through the canister and back into the purge, into the engine to burn it off, okay? So the vent solenoid, this is the one that gives us a lot of problems. Why? Because since this is always open, there could be, I've seen spiders, spider webs, rocks, mud, all in here, okay? So when the computer commands it closed, it can't close because it's either damaged restricted something's holding it open and then that's going to give you a large evap leak okay so case in point always take a look at these vent solenoids as well and the fuel tank pressure sensor is just a fancy name for a map sensor map this sensor sits on top of the fuel pump or on the tank and it's going to be measuring the vacuum applied to the tank so when the vehicle is testing itself for leaks it's going to open the purge valve close the vent solenoid allow vacuum into the system and it's going to fill the tank with vacuum once it's full of vacuum, it shuts the purge solenoid off, keeps the vent solenoid off, seals the system, and then it's going to monitor the fuel tank pressure. If fuel tank pressure remains at a constant level, then it knows there's no leaks. If it begins to drop off, it's going to measure how long it drops off for, and then it's going to know if it's a small, very small, medium, or large leak. Okay, Then it's going to set a code for it. Now, I've also seen these fuel tank pressure sensors actually give uh, create false codes. One way to test for a fuel tank pressure sensor is, and this is how hard this test is, plug in your scanner, look at the FTP, go and take the fuel cap off. If I take the cap off and pressure changes, sensor probably works. Okay, so that's one of the easier ways to actually do it without actually dropping the fuel tank. Okay, the next emission component we're talking about is exhaust gas recirculation valve or EGR. So the EGR's responsibility is to help us reduce NOx. Anytime you guys are diagnosing a NOx problem, always think about does this car have an EGR? And if it does, does the EGR work? Because the EGR's responsibility is to help us lower NOx. Okay? So the one you guys are seeing right here on the left-hand side is a uh, back pressure EGR. This is a positive back pressure valve. So this valve right here actually needs exhaust gas to actually open the valve. So this one doesn't use vacuum like our negative back pressure EGRs. So this one, the way we check them is mirroring a flashlight and we use one of the inspection holes right here to actually see if the diaphragm is lifting. Usually you have to power break the vehicle to create enough back pressure for it to lift the EGR up or what I do is I'll shove a, a camera in there, boroscope, and then watch my camera screen, back um, power break it and watch that valve lift. If it lifts then I know the valve's lifting um, <clears throat> and it's not going to be the actual valve. If it's a vacuum operated valve, make sure that the vacuum to the actual tip is working. As vacuum is applied, it's going to lift the diaphragm and then that's going to allow exhaust gases into the intake. Same thing on the positive back pressure EGR. The reason why we're putting exhaust gases into the intake is because ex oxygen in the exhaust has already been used up. Because there's no oxygen, it's an inert gas now. That inert gas is going to cool down the combustion chamber and that's going to help us reduce NOx. Anytime we go above 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit in the combustion chamber, we lose control of NOx, 
and then Knox goes through the roof. Okay, so here's an air injection system that I was talking about earlier. Okay, this is an electronic one. Here's our electronic pump. Okay, here's our secondary valve and here's our electronic switch. This pump is going to be commanded by the PCM to a relay. Relay turns on the pump. Pump then goes to this valve here, this check valve. This vacuum solenoid applies vacuum to the check valve and then that allows air downstream into the exhaust where then it's going to help us warm up the cat, begin to oxidize and reduce HC and CO on cold startup. If this was an old belt driven pump, okay, once the cat was good, then the diverter valve would close and then open this to atmosphere because this pump was belt driven so it was always producing oxygen. So that diverter valve will then push it out into the air and you were golden. With the new electronic ones, they just turn them off and then you're ready to roll. All right, so let's talk about some computer computerized engine systems. So one thing that one of the sensors we want to look at is TPS. This is a, an input, right? So this is a potentiometer. This potentiometer is going to convert movement into a variable voltage, okay? So like any three-wire sensor, what are the three wires? You should have said power, ground, and signal return, or reference, right? VREF, ground, and signal return, okay? So depending on how much we move the throttle is going to be how we vary the voltage. One thing you guys want to remember when it comes to a TPS, you usually want to see close throttle at idle between half a volt to seven tenths of a volt. Outside of that might indicate a problem or it might be a drive by wire system where the throttle position sensor is actually connected to the throttle plate itself. Here what we're looking at is we're looking at a lap scope screen of a bad throttle position sensor. So as I begin to accelerate, voltage goes up, but then you guys notice this huge dropout here. Whenever I have a dropout like this, the computer can't tell the difference between a bad sensor and you letting go of the throttle. Because of that, when the computer sees a dropout like this, what it does is it's going to back off the fuel. So then the customer is going to complain of, hey, I'm on a light and I gun it and it takes, the, takes off and then just does this and then it takes back up. That right there is letting you know that some, for some reason the computer backed off fuel. And this is a very common problem and it won't set a code. I had a customer that brought me a, a Mitsubishi for an EGR code that wouldn't, uh, EGR monitor that I wouldn't set. They had replaced EGR, O2 sensors. They were about to replace the computer before I got it. This was during COVID, so I was I actually diagnosed it here in my house. When the car got dropped off, I told him, leave it there. I'll check it right now. Came inside, grabbed my scan tool, went outside, plugged it in. Key on engine off. The first thing I noticed was my throttle position sensor was over one volt that that was a big problem so I came back inside grabbed me a stubby uh flathead uh, excuse me phillips head screwdriver unscrewed it backed it off best i could get it was like 700 millivolts tightened it down cleared the light and i left my house um i think i got about a half a mile from home before the monitor set came back home checked it no pending codes everything was golden called the customer and he's like there's no way i was like yeah it's done man so I charged them a diag fee. Why? Because it was my time, my knowledge to actually diagnose that. All it was was a misadjusted input. So this is why input and input verification is very important. A potentiometer just isn't for throttle actuation. Right here, this is an EVP or EGR valve position sensor from a Ford. So if you guys have been around for a while like I have, the old Fords used to have a linear position sensor that sat on top of the valve. This is how the computer would know if the valve actually opened, okay? So it works the same way. Power, ground, signal, return. Depending on the position of the sensor, is going to be the voltage going back to the computer. I had a Chevy Venture once that I worked on. A shop brought it to us because they couldn't get the EGR code to go away. Um, new EGR was installed. The car was in the same condition. First thing I did, key on engine off, plugged in my scanner. Position, zero. Cool. Started the car up. I said, wait a minute position actually showed like 12 percent open i was like huh that's not normal um so then i said well the only way that position sensor could be open is if electrically something's commanding the egr on so i turned the car off opened the hood and the first thing i noticed was that the connector for the egr was super stretched and the egr kind of looked weird to me well and what ended up happening is two shops in a row installed the egr on backwards so they put the position sensor, which was this side, on the exhaust positive side. So when the exhaust pressure built, it actually lifted the EGR open 
and that would go into the intake causing a rough idle and giving me an EGR code. All it was was improper installation due to improper uh, verification and actually checking it more than anything. Um, what tech could have done is pull the EGR off, started the car. Yeah, it was going to run like crap, but then you could verify which one was the exhaust port, which one was intake, and go from there. But no, they just kept putting it on the same position, backwards. <clears throat> and this is why it goes back to always check the basics. So here we have an engine coolant temperature. This is an NTC type coolant temp. Okay, so we have a 5 volt reference feed to the sensor. Depending on the voltage drop inside of the thermistor, it's going to go back up. And then this signal return over here to the side is how the computer is going to know what the voltage drop is of the actual thermistor. Depending on the voltage drop is how the computer knows what the actual temperature is of that particular engine coolant temp or intake air temp, cabin temp, or whatever that sensor is actually detecting. So here I give you guys a quick graph. Notice how as, as resistance begins to drop, right that's telling you that the temperature is actually getting hotter so that's a negative temperature coefficient okay as the vehicle gets hotter voltage actually goes down okay and if you have a PTC it's gonna be the opposite as the vehicle gets hotter voltage goes up okay so on most cars it's an NTC type as the vehicle gets hotter voltage drops okay so like you guys could see here cold engine we're almost at 5 volts normal operating temperature we're at 500 millivolts somewhere around there okay so always keep that in mind so here's our fuel injectors okay and here's the armature that's going to lift the pencil once this is magnetized then it's going to allow the injector to open and then allow fuel to come out of it if you guys don't remember or have never used a lap scope on a fuel injector here's a fuel injector trace this is source voltage a to b at b the computer turns on the driver and pulls it to ground so as it pulls it to ground from B to C, this is the on time of the injector. This is how long that fuel injector was actually on and spraying fuel. Then when you turn off the fuel injector, you're gonna get a voltage spike. This is absolutely normal. You wanna see this voltage spike go above 35 volts. If it didn't, then that's what indicating to you that that injector is actually weak. The armature in that injector is weak and that injector needs to be tested a little bit further. Then after that, around here, you usually see a small nipple and that little nipple is indicating that the, the fuel injector actually came back to its seat. Pintle seated, okay? And then E, again, is going back to its normal reference voltage. And then here, we're looking at an idle air control valve. Some vehicles now don't use this because it's integrated to the throttle plate. But if you do have to diagnose a car that has an idle air control valve, always keep this in mind. If the vehicle is idling, but your idle air control valve shows zero counts or zero percent, that means that the valve is fully closed. So how is it that the car is actually on? If this valve's responsibility is to maintain small amount of air to keep the engine running, and this is fully closed, how is the engine running? If you guys said vacuum leak, you're spot on, okay? I got to diagnose, my first time I ever ran into this was on a Saturn. Came from another shop, customer's complaint was erratic idle. And first thing I noticed was idle air control was zero. So I said, how is this at zero? And I'm at about 1500 RPM. Pulled out the propane enrichment tool and I found a vacuum leak on the intake manifold gasket. Called the customer. She didn't believe me. And with, I mean, obviously it's kind of obvious. Well, you know, shop A already, you know, took a lot of money from her and the problem was still there. So she was kind of reluctant. I told her, hey, look, these are the tests I ran. If you want to come down, I'll show them to you. Finally, agreed. she agreed to do the, the gasket. We did the gasket, took care of the problem, and she was a lifetime customer. Once I left the shop, she was actually still a customer of the shop. So this is important to make sure that you guys understand how does the system work and what am I expecting to see on this particular system. Uh, here's a diagram from Ford, uh, excuse me, GM. Okay, This doesn't apply to all vehicles. Keep this in mind. And I showed this to my students not too long ago on a Toyota that we have here as a lab car. Our Toyota has a map sensor, right? And at idle, it wasn't showing um, the vacuum as we see it here on this GM, okay? So we had to look up the spec from Toyota, and the spec is different. So this is just a reference, but this is not to anything outside of GM. This is GM only, okay? 
So, whether you're dealing with a MAP sensor, fuel tank pressure sensor, or fuel rail pressure sensor, it's the same thing, okay? It's a pressure sensor, absolute pressure sensor. So, voltage is going to increase, right, as pressure increases, right? So, the lower the, the voltage means you have vacuum. So, inside of the MAP sensor, when the car is at idle, it should be about one volt. Why? Because I got vacuum inside of the engine, okay? So, keep that in mind. All right, so that concludes all our refresher. Now it's time to do some practice questions. So let's go ahead and go through these practice questions. This is being recorded, so this is gonna give you guys a good ability to go back and review these. These questions come from ASC, um, and we're gonna kinda go through them together and then go over the answer, all right? So if you guys wanna take these, one of the things I would recommend is get a stopwatch and give yourself one minute and 30 seconds. That number is not a magic number I came up with. That number is the amount of time you have to answer one question on an ASC. So it's one minute, 30 seconds. Okay, if you guys are ready, I'm ready. Let's go ahead and get started. So number one, an engine is equipped with an ignition system shown, idles smoothly but misfires on acceleration. Which of these could be the cause? High resistance at W. W is right here. If I have high resistance on the ground control side to this coil, that could definitely cause this oil coil to not fire properly and give me a misfire. A is possible. B, open fuse at X. So if this fuse here, this fuse also splices down in parallel to coil one, two, three, and four. So if I lose this fuse, I would lose all four coils. There's no way the car would idle smoothly, right? So B is wrong. C, a short to ground at Y. This is Y. And this is one, two, three, and four coil feeds. And if I shorted it here, that would create another path to ground, meaning amperage would go up and blow this fuse. If the short was here, this fuse would blow, meaning I would lose all four coils, the car wouldn't start. That is also wrong. An open crankshaft position sensor. If the crankshaft position sensor is out, the car wouldn't start. So, it's not that. Our best answer here would be W. So, best answer for number one would be A. Number two, while the engine is running, technician pulls the PCV valve out of the valve cover and plugs the valve opening. There is no change in engine operation. So if I pull the valve out and I plug it, RPM should drop. And if it doesn't, I got a problem. So technician A says the PCV valve could be stuck in the open position. If it was stuck in the open position the moment I unplugged it, what would happen? RPM would change. Technician B says that the hose between the intake manifold and PCV valve could be plugged. Absolutely. If I pull it out and there's no RPM change, it's restricted. So what's my best answer here? Tech B only. Okay. After comparison readings, after the compression, sorry, after the compression readings shown in the illustration were taken, a wet compression test was made. The second set of readings were almost the same as the first. So I have 145, 135, and 140. Technician A says that a burnt valve could be the cause. Technician B says that a broken piston ring could be the cause. So whenever you do a compression reading, a compression test, and you add oil, and compression doesn't increase, the rings are good. Because what the oil is doing is it's going to create a seal, a temporary seal around the rings. So if you add oil and it doesn't come up in compression, the rings are fine. So this would indicate to me that I have a burnt valve. So I would say tech A. And the answer is tech A. Blue smoke comes from the exhaust pipe of a vehicle. Technician A says that a blocked cylinder head oil return passage could be the cause. And technician B says that a stuck open engine thermostat could be the cause. So blue smoke is an indicator of oil right so anytime we have oil consumption that's going to increase or give us blue smoke black smoke is fuel related so what do you guys think is the best answer here let's take a look see hey if i have a blocked cylinder head return passage that means that oil pressure is going to increase and that's usually going to start getting sucked up through the pcv system and then that's going to end up inside the combustion chamber Five, a vehicle is being diagnosed for poor fuel economy. Engine test shows a rich exhaust gas mixture. Technician A says that a failed oxygen sensor could be the cause. 
Technician B says that a failed engine coolant temperature sensor could be the cause. So let's take a look. So the vehicle has poor fuel economy. The oxygen sensor's responsibility is to adjust air fuel mixture. So if I have a bad O2, can that affect my fuel economy? Absolutely. And then B says that an engine coolant temperature sensor could be the cause. If the engine coolant temperature sensor is reading colder than normal, the computer is going to want to compensate and add more fuel in order to warm the engine up. So I would say C. And we're right, both A and B. All right, a vacuum gauge is connected to the intake manifold of an engine. With the engine running at 2,000 RPM, the pointer on the gauge fluctuates between 10 and 22 inches of vacuum. What could be the cause? A leaking intake manifold gasket is going to be really low, somewhere about 6 to 9 inches. So that's not going to be it. Not worn piston rings. Valve guides is usually about 1 or 2 inches. So I'm thinking of a broken valve spring on this one. And our answer is broken valve spring. Why? Because the valve spring's responsibility is to close the valve. Right? If the spring's broken, it's going to take longer to actually close it. Thus, it's going to allow more positive pressure in the intake instead of negative pressure. And that's going to create what? A drop. So that's why you're getting the boom, 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 boom effect. <clears throat> the technician finds no spark and no injector pulse on a vehicle that will not start. What could be the cause? So if I have no spark and no fuel, okay, what sensor is usually the one that's responsible for that? Okay, crankshaft. Mass airflow, doubt it. Crankshaft, yes. Throttle position, doubt it. Fuel pump module, doubt it. So I would say crankshaft. Let's take a look. Cool, we got it right. Crankshaft position sensor's responsibility is for timing, spark, and fuel. Okay. An engine with a return type electronic fuel injection system has high fuel pressure at idle. What could be the cause? Low manifold vacuum? leaking fuel pump check valve, plugged fuel injector, or a high manifold vacuum. If I had low vacuum, how is that going to affect my fuel pressure? It might, right? Because we have a return type fuel injection system, so that's a fuel pressure regulator. No fuel, no low vacuum on the regulator is going to create cause the regulator to actually close, maintaining higher pressure on the actual rail. Leaking fuel pump check valve. If the check valve was leaking, we'd have lower pressure. A plug fuel fuel injector. That could be also. And then high manifold vacuum. No, that wouldn't be it. So low manifold vacuum is going to cause the fuel pressure regulator to close, maintaining higher fuel pressure on the actual rail. Okay, so that could be uh, the problem there. Which of these would cause a catalytic converter to overheat? So a catalytic converter is an oxidation catalyst. Okay, and that's going to help us reduce HCCO and then convert NOx or oxides of nitrogen just to nitrogen. Okay, So a broken air pump drive belt. Well, if the drive belt's broken, the pump's not working, so there's no oxygen going to the cat, so that wouldn't be it. A plug canister purge valve. Well, if the purge valve is plugged, then no, there's no fuel vapors going into the intake, so that can't be it. A stuck closed EGR valve, that can't, happen, uh, that can't cause it. It can happen, but it won't cause it. If the valve's closed... No exhaust gas is recirculating, so we can't lower NOx temperature, so that's not it. If I have a spark plug wire or a cylinder is not firing properly, all that raw fuel is going into the cat, and the cat's already warm. So if I have a warm cat, a warm cat with raw fuel in it, then I'm going to start to overheat it and lead to meltdown of the actual cat. So disconnected spark plug wire would be our best bet. Any of these could be the cause. Any of these could cause an exhaust gas recirculation insufficient flow detected, except, keyword, except, an exhaust leak, stuck open EGR, a restricted EGR, or an electronically open EGR solenoid. So the best one I would think here would be in a, a stuck open EGR. If I have a stuck open EGR, it's not going to give me an insufficient flow detected. So let's see. Perfect. All the other ones are going to give me insufficient flow. If I have an exhaust leak, there's not enough exhaust pressure to actually go through the valve. So it's going to give me insufficient flow. If the ports are plugged, there's not going to be any flow. So it's going to be insufficient flow. If the valve electronically is open, there's no way for the, the solenoids to create a magnetism and open the valve. So that's going to give me insufficient flow. So my best answer here would be B. Okay, we got another one. 
A vehicle is being diagnosed for a rough idle. Technician connects a vacuum gauge to the intake manifold with the engine at idle and observes the needle fluctuates rapidly between 15 inches and 20 inches. What could be the cause? An open fuel injector winding? No. Bad spark plug wire? No. Burnt valve? Possible. Intake gasket leak? Vacuum would be a lot lower than 15 inches. So I would go with C, burnt valve. Let's take a look. And C is the right answer. Technician is measuring starter amperage draw. The reading observed on the meter is above specification. Technician A says that low engine compression could be the cause. Technician B says that low resistance between the positive battery post and the cable could be the cause. Who is correct? Well, if you guys remember doing a relative compression test, anytime I run into compression, I get more current draw. Okay, So it's saying the starter amperage draw is above spec. So that means I'm going to draw more. So that means higher compression. So technician A says low compression. Wrong. Technician B says low resistance between positive battery posts. What does that have to do with anything, right? So what's our best answer here? D. Let's take a look. D, the right answer. Why? Because these both of these guys are wrong. That has nothing to do with starter amperage draw. Excessive leakage is found while performing a cylinder leak down test. Air could be heard escaping through the oil fill opening. What could be the cause? So you raise the cylinder up to top dead center compression, you put shop air in it, and you're hearing air coming out through the oil fill cap. Could that be worn valve guides? No. Piston rings? Yeah. Cracked intake manifold? No. And then a cracked intake valve? No. So I would say worn piston rings. And that's our best answer. Worn rings. And that concludes it, guys. So I hope that with the information I was, air to sh I was able to share with you guys and the whole review, this gets you guys ready for the ASC exam. One thing I'll tell you guys is a lot of my students who took this review have already passed it. Um, and they all said that everything we went over was what they needed. Okay, one thing I'll tell you guys is if you don't pass the ASC, it's not the end of the world. I filled, ASC, I filled a lot of ASCs. And that doesn't mean I suck. That just means that there's areas that you need to work on. Do I know everything? Hell no. Do I expect to know everything? Never. Why? Because it's, there's certain things I don't do. Okay. For those of you guys that know me, my specialties are electrical, engine performance, and emissions. So if it doesn't fall into those categories, yes, I know it. But will I be the best guy to do it? Probably not. Because it's probably going to take me longer to research it to actually do it than if it falls into my three priorities, my three categories. Okay. So if you guys don't pass it, it's okay. But go back and look at your results and see what area do I need to get better on. This way you can come back and then knock it out of the park and then go from there. This review was done based off of my experiences with ASC A8, my students' experiences doing ASC A8. And I hope that it helps you guys achieve whatever goals you guys are trying to achieve. I really appreciate you guys hanging in there with me throughout this whole training. I hope this training will help you a lot and hopefully it helps you open up your mind to wanting to better yourself as a technician so this way you can increase your value. As everybody knows here at Master Automotive Training, we're here to better the automotive industry one technician at a time, and it starts with you. Anything we can do to help you guys, please let us know in the comments. Hopefully, uh, it does take me some time to actually reply to them because I'm the one replying, So, but I will get back to you guys as soon as I possibly can. Hopefully, I see you guys in one of my classes real soon, or hopefully, I get to sit in one of your classes sometime in the near future. Good luck, guys, on your venture. If you guys have any questions, put them in the comments. Make sure that you guys are have subscribed and are following the channel. Also, make sure you turn on the notifications so you guys get a ding anytime I drop a new video. This way, I help you guys and help the industry one technician at a time. Hope you guys are doing great, and we'll see you guys on the next one. Signing off here, Oscar Gomez from SmartAutoTraining.com.